Greetings, this is Chaplain Bob Walker, Light of the World Ministries. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. A lot of people don't know it, but the entire Bible is to, for, and about a people called Israel, and specifically their Redeemer, Christ, the Messiah. So, this is going to be Fire, Part 7, and we're going to read Isaiah, parts of Isaiah chapter, well, maybe the whole thing, Isaiah chapter 8, and then we're going to cover Isaiah chapter 9. I was going to do just chapter 9, but the... Um, previous part, the context is important, so I'm having to lay the background. Now, Isaiah chapter 8, verse 1. Forgive me if I mispronounce some of these names. Moreover, the Lord said unto me, Take thee a great roll. Now, we're not talking about a piece of bread here. We're talking about a, a writing something that you write it upon, uh, would write upon, a roll or, or a scroll. Take thee a great roll and write in it with a man's pen concerning Meher Shala Hashbaz. And I, now that's a name. I don't know what it means, but it's a name. And I took upon me faithful witness to record Uriah the priest, and Zechariah the son of Zeber Echiah. And I went unto the prophetess. See, there was prophetesses in the Bible, female prophets. God used them. Deborah, one of the judges of Israel, she was a prophetess. For you ladies that are interested, I did a couple of Bible studies on women in the Bible. And I went unto the prophetess, and she conceived and bare a son. Then said the Lord to me, Call his name Meir Shalah Hashbaz. For before the child shall have knowledge to cry, My father and my mother the riches of Damascus and the spoil of Samaria shall be taken away before the king of Assyria. Now, if you don't know it, the Assyrian Empire conquered the northern kingdom of Israel and took many of the cities and towns of southern Judah. It was a split kingdom at this time. They had different kings, different land areas. They even had fought, uh, Israel and Judah had even fought some wars against each other, some skirmishes. So northern Israel went into captivity with the Assyrians. And then eventually the Assyrian Empire collapsed when Babylon came around. Babylon had conquered the Assyrians and had conquered Jerusalem and all the rest of Judah. And the book of Daniel records how the Babylonians took Judah to Babylon. Um, but prior to that, the Assyrians had taken northern Israel, uh, parts of the ten tribes, to Assyria. Well, what they did was they would take people from one area and move them to another and then take the people that they conquered from that area to into Israel. That's sort of like you conquer the United States. You take the people from California and you put them in Arizona. You, you take the people from Arizona and put them in California. The purpose for this was simple. Well, you wouldn't know the land area you wouldn't know where to hide, and you wouldn't have 
if you stashed weapons away prior during the invasion, well, now you're hundreds of miles away and it'd be very hard to do what is called a guerrilla warfare. So, plus, the um, it'd be very difficult when you take a group of people and you split them up and move them around, it's hard to get everybody together to create a rebellion. Now, the reason the thing is, Israel was scattered among the Assyrian Empire. When the Assyrian Empire collapsed, they didn't want to live among the Assyrians anymore. You know, the army was destroyed by the Babylonians, and the Assyrians were really evil and cruel, so Israel took off. That makes for a very, very interesting study. And a lot of historians, and I believe Bible prophecy, shows that they went north. And if you look north of the Middle East, you end up in Europe. I mean, after all, what group of people built the churches, printed the Bibles, took, sent missionaries all over the world? Not Africa, not Asia. It was Europe. Europe invented the printing press. Europe printed the Bibles. Europe built the churches. Granted, it was corrupted, but nevertheless, and the funny thing is, the Caucasians appeared in history about the same time that Israel vanished from history. So, so here it is. You can read more about that. There's all kinds of information out there, uh, especially in the old, old books prior to the wicked ones buying up all the printing and publishing houses and their control of the internet. It's a shame. You can read about uh, people like E. Raymond Capt, C-A-P-T. Take a look, you know. So, all right, so, verse 5, Isaiah 8, verse 5. The Lord spake also unto me, saying, Forasmuch as this people refuseth the waters of Shiloh that go softly and rejoice in reason and Remaliah's son, now therefore, behold, the Lord bringeth up upon them the waters of the river, strong and man, many, even the king of Assyria. Now, here it is. God is, through Isaiah, is talking about rivers of water, strong and many, even the king of Assyria and all his glory and he shall come up over all his channels and go over all his banks. It's talking about a flood of people uh, here. I mean, it's comparing waters, a river, and it says, even the king of Assyria. Now, if you don't believe me, let's go to Revelation chapter 17. All right, Revelation 17, verse 12. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings. So horns are representative of kings. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. These shall have one mind, and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. These shall make war with the Lamb, 
and the Lamb shall overcome them. For he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. Huh. Those that are with him are called. Called of who? Called of God. Called, chosen, and faithful. But, you know, the churches always say that, you know, we make the decision. But here it is, it says, we're called, chosen, and faithful. Verse 15. And he saith unto me, now listen carefully, the waters, the waters, which thou sawest, where the whore sitteth, are peoples, and multitudes, and nations, and tongues. So the whore is sitting on many waters, and the waters which thou sawest, where the horse sitteth are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. So, does that, doesn't that make sense? Isaiah chapter 8, verse 7. Now therefore, behold, the Lord bringeth up upon them the waters of the river, strong and many, even, even the king of Assyria, and all his glory, and he shall come up over all his channels and go over all his banks. And I talk about banks of the rivers, people, not, not financial institutions here. Haven't you ever heard of a navigational channel? You know, we're not talking about a TV channel here. Verse 8, And he shall pass through Judah. Yeah, the Assyrians not only conquered northern Israel, they went through uh, Judah, and if memory serves me correctly, they tried to take uh, Jerusalem, but the Lord destroyed the Assyrian army. He wouldn't let them have Jerusalem, but he conquered much of Judah also. And then people will try to uh, convince you that uh, Germany and what have you is Assyria because the people that were taken into Assyria from Israel, a lot of them, maybe Judah, ended up in Germany. So they'll try to tell you that Germany's Assyria. Yeah, part of them might be, but consider this. All the king royalty of Europe, the majority of which were of German extraction. Germany was the one of the main points of the Reformation, the so-called Protestant Reformation, Martin Luther, Germany invented the printing press. Does that sound like something the Assyrians would do? Judah was to be the tribe of the kings. Germany supplied many kings. England had some German kings that couldn't even speak English. England had a German king that couldn't even speak English. I mean, all kinds of European royalty were of German extraction. Look it up. I'm not making this stuff up as I go. They hide this stuff from us. And Germany was to be, uh, Judah was to be first in war. Do you know that it took half the world to defeat Germany in battle in World War I? And World War II took half the world. The Americans, the Germans in America, helped defeat the Germans in Germany. In World War I, Germany was, uh, people in the United States of German extraction was approximately 25%, according to an old history book that I had. And I lost it because of one of the, uh, one of the chosen ones. But that's all right. He'll get his one day. All right, Isaiah 8.8. 8. And he, who's he? The king of Assyria. And he shall pass through Judah. He shall overflow and go over. 
he shall reach even to the neck. Yeah, Jerusalem. And the stretching out of his wings shall fill the breadth of thy land, O Emmanuel. All right, let's take a look at Isaiah chapter 37. I'm going to prove a point. Now, the king of Assyria had surrounded Jerusalem. Isaiah 37, chapter 10. Now, they're, they're Hezekiah is the king of Judah, and the envoy, or whoever, the, the Syrian empire is speaking. And he says, Thus shall you speak to Hezekiah, king of Judah, saying, Let not thy God, in whom thou trustest, deceive thee, saying, Jerusalem shall not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Oh, yeah. Don't trust in God. Don't be deceived. That's what this guy's saying. Your God's not going to be able to save you people. No way. That's the Bob translation. So, Verse 11. Behold, thou, thou hast heard what the kings of Assyria have done to all lands by destroying them utterly. And shalt thou be delivered? Have the gods of the nations... Deliver them which my fathers have destroyed, as Gozan and Haran and Rezeph and the children of Eden, which were in Telassar. Where is the king of Hamath and the king of Arphad and the king of the city of Shephar, Shepharvaim, Hannah and Iva? And Hezekiah received the letter from the hand of the messengers and read it. And Hezekiah went up unto the house of the Lord, and spread it before the Lord. And Hezekiah prayed unto the Lord, saying, O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, if only we had a, a, a leader in the United States and Europe that would felt like this, but that's too much to ask. Instead, we got the Donald. And people actually think he's going to make America great again. I don't think so, but that's just my opinion. The king of Israel says, O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, that dwellest between the cherubims, thou art the God, even thou alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth, thou hast made heaven and earth. Incline thy ear, O Lord, and hear, Open thine eyes, O Lord, and see, and hear all the words of Sennacherib, which hath sent to reproach the living God. Of a truth, Lord, the king of Assyria hath laid waste all the nations and their countries, and have cast their gods into the fire, for they were no gods but the work of men's hands, wood and stone. Therefore they have destroyed them. Now therefore, O Lord our God, save us from his hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that thou art the Lord, even thou only. Then Isaiah the son of Amoz sent unto Hezekiah, saying, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Whereas thou hast prayed to me against Sennacherib, king of Assyria, this is the word which the Lord hath spoken concerning him. The virgin, the daughter of Zion, hath despised thee and laughed thee to scorn. The daughter of Jerusalem hath shaken her head at thee. Whom hast thou reproached and blasphemed? And against whom hast thou exalted thy voice and lifted up thine eyes on high, even against the Holy One of Israel? You see, people, it was Israel and Judah... And Jerusalem, they were the ones that blasphemed the Lord. And now the Assyrian Empire was God's rod of indignation, his, his punishment to them. I mean, that's what, that's what Isaiah seemed here. Verse 23, Whom hast thou reproached and blasphemed, and against 
Whom hast thou exalted thy voice and lifted up thine eyes on high, even against the Holy One of Israel? But thy servants hast thou reproached the Lord, and hast said, By the multitude of my chariots am I come up to the height of the mountains, to the sides of Lebanon, and I will cut down the tall cedars, those are trees, and I will cut down the tall cedars thereof, and the choice fir, fir trees thereof, and I will enter into the height of his border and the forest of his Carmel. I have digged and drunk water, and with the sole of my feet have I dried up all the rivers of the besieged places. Hast thou not heard long ago how I have done it, and of ancient times that I formed it? Now have I brought it to pass that thou shouldest be to lay waste defensed cities into ruinous heaps. Therefore their inhabitants were of small power. They were dismayed and confounded. They were as the grass of the field. And what happens to the grass of the field? One day it's nice and green, and the next day it's brown and dead. They were as the grass of the field and of the green herb, as the grass on the housetops and as corn blasted before it be grown up. But I know thy abode, and thy going out, and thy coming in, and thy rage against me. Because they rage against, because thy rage against me and thy tumult, tumult is come into mine ears, therefore I will put my hook in thy nose, and my bridle in thy lips, and I will turn thee back by the way by which thou camest. And this shall be a sign unto thee. Ye shall eat this year such as groweth of itself, and the second year that which springeth of the same. And in the third year sow ye and reap and plant vineyards and eat the fruit thereof. And the remnant that is escaped of the house of Judah shall again take root downward and bear fruit upward. All right, so the point is, the Assyrians took part of Judah, part of the other cities close to Jerusalem. So God's telling you that the remnant that has escaped of the house of Judah shall again take root downward and bear fruit upward. So there's going to be a, a remnant of the house of Judah. And these were these were not all from Jerusalem. The Assyrian Empire took part of Judah and they went along with parts of Israel. So, verse 32. For out of Jerusalem shall go forth a remnant, and they that escape out of Mount Zion, the zeal of the Lord of hosts shall do this. Now, I'll guarantee you the, uh, the remnant did not carry around the Babylonian Talmud. I'll guarantee you that. For out of Jerusalem shall go forth a remnant, and they that escape out of Mount Zion, the zeal of the Lord of hosts, shall do this. Therefore thus saith the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, He shall not come into this city, nor shoot an arrow there, nor come before it with shields, nor cast a bank against it. Now, you know, like the bank of a river, I guess a bank is a type of siege engine used to build a breach, the walls. Maybe it's something on wheels that you would push up against the wall so that the soldiers could climb up. That's what I'm guessing. Verse 34. By the way that he came, by the same shall he return, and shall not come into the city, saith the Lord. For I will defend this city. Oh, God's going to defend the city. For I will defend the city to save it for mine own sake, and for my servant David's sake. Then the angel of the Lord went forth and smote. That means he struck him and smote in the camp of the Assyrians a hundred and fourscore and five thousand. That's a hundred and eighty-five 
thousand dead troops. That is an army, people. And when they rose early in the morning, behold, they were all dead corpses. Huh. One angel of the Lord killed 185,000 soldiers. Think about that. Remember in the garden when the soldiers were getting ready to take Jesus to the trial of the Sanhedrin and the crucifixion? He, Peter took his sword and cut off the servant's ear. And Jesus told him, put the sword back in its place. And he says, think not that I could call legions of angels. Now, if one angel could kill 185,000, what, what could an, a legion of angels do? Or legions of angels. So, behold, they were all dead corpses. Boy, I tell you what, that that would be a job. Can you imagine burying, burying 185,000 corpses? I mean, what kind of a job would that be? Verse 37. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed, went and returned, and dwelt at Nineveh. And it came to pass as he was worshiping in the house of Nisrosh, his god, that Adremelech and Shariezer, his sons, smote him with the sword. Oh, how's that? His own two, two of his own sons killed him. His sons smote him with the sword, and they escaped into the land of Armenia. Armenia. And Ezar, Ezar, Hadan, his son, reigned in his stead. Do you know where Armenia is? Armenia is north of Turkey and Iran. It's part of the land bridge that connects the Middle East with what they call Asia Minor. And Turkey used to be part of Greece until the peace-loving Muslims went in and slaughtered all the Greeks. So, all right, let's go back to Isaiah 8 and verse 8. And he, who? The king of Assyria. And he shall pass through Judah. He shall overflow and go over. He shall reach even to the neck, and the stretching out of his wings shall fill the breath of thy land, O Emmanuel. Yeah, he conquered a great deal of Judah, but God wouldn't let him take Jerusalem for David's sake. Now, what does Emmanuel mean? Well, Matthew 1 and verse 23 tells you, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. God with us. You see, Jesus was no mere man. God with us. So, every time you hear the word Yeshua by all these Judaizers, ask them, why don't you use the name Emmanuel? Emmanuel is in the Old Testament, and Emmanuel is in the New Testament. Why do they have to use a word that's not in the New Testament? Verse 8, Isaiah 8, 8. And he shall pass through Judah, he shall overflow and go over, he shall reach even to the neck, and the stretching out of his wings shall fill the breath of thy land, O Emmanuel. Associate yourselves, O ye people, and ye shall be broken in pieces, and give ear all ye of far countries. Gird yourself, and ye shall be broken in pieces. Gird yourself, and ye shall be broken in pieces. One thing I always learned in college, when the teacher repeated themselves twice on something, it was important. It was something that was going to be on the test. 
Here it is. God said this twice. Ye shall be broken in pieces. Verse 10. Take counsel together and it shall come to naught. That means nothing. Speak the word and, and, and it shall not stand, for God is with us. For the Lord spake thus to me with a strong hand and instructed me that I should not walk in the way of this people, saying, Say ye not a confederacy to all them to whom this people shall say, a confederacy, neither fear ye their feared, nor be afraid. See, these people were relying on the, the heathen satanic nations all around them. That's what a confederacy is. Oh yeah, we're going to make a, a, a pact with you. We're going to make a, a promise. You know, We're going to stand by your side, and you're going to stand by our side, and we'll protect you, and you protect us. And the Lord's saying, uh-uh. A confederacy, neither fear ye their fear, nor be afraid. Verse 13. Sanctify. That means to set aside, to hold as holy, separated. Sanctify the Lord of hosts himself, and let him be your fear, and let him be your dread for he shall be a sanctuary, but for a stone of stumbling, a stone of stumbling, and for a rock of offense to both the houses of Israel, that's Israel and Judah, for a gin and for a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Who is the stone of stumbling? In Isaiah 28, 16, we read, Therefore thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a foundation stone, people, not a capstone. Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 6, Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you therefore which believe he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient. The stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner, and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. But ye, talking about believers, in Christ the stone, but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Get the point? In 1 Peter 2 and verse 4, To whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. Mark 12, 10, Jesus. And have ye not read this scripture? The stone which the builders rejected is become the head of the corner. Matthew 21, 4. I'm sorry, Matthew 21, verse 42. Jesus saith unto them, Did ye never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected, the same as become the head of the corner? This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. All right, let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1. Now, Corinthians, Corinth was a city in Greece, 
And Paul's telling these people that their descendants were with Moses and Israel coming out of Egypt. Let's read it. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant. What is ignorant? It means they don't know something. I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea, the Red Sea. When Moses parted the Red Sea so that Israel could escape from Egypt. Verse 2, and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and did all eat the same spiritual meat, the manna from heaven, right? And did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Remember they were out in the desert and there was a rock that Moses struck and it gave forth water. All right, back to Isaiah 8, verse 14. And he shall be for a sanctuary. What's a sanctuary? A place of safety. But for a stone of stumbling and for a rock of offense to both the houses of Israel for a gin and for a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And many among them shall stumble and fall and be broken and be snared and be taken. Many stumbled and fell at the words of Christ. Verse 16, bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples. And I will wait upon the Lord that hideth his face, hideth his face from the house of Jacob, and I will look for him. You know, people, when the Lord hides his face from you, it's all over but the dying. Behold, I and the children whom the Lord hath given me are for signs and for wonders in Israel from the Lord of hosts, which dwelleth in Mount Zion. And when they shall say unto you, Seek unto them that have familiar spirits, and unto wizards that peep and that mutter. Oh yeah, go, go look after Harry Potter. Go look unto fallen angels, the devils, the demons. Seek unto them that have familiar spirits, the witches and unto wizards that peep and that mutter. Should not a people seek unto their God for the living, to the dead, to the law and to, their, to, and to the testimony? If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them, and they shall pass through it, hardly bestead and hungry, and it shall come to pass that when they are hungry, they shall fret themselves and curse their king and their God and look upward. And they shall look unto the earth and behold trouble and darkness, dimness of anguish, and they shall be driven to darkness. Yep, that's what happens, people, when you walk away from the Lord and you're reading Harry Potter instead of the holy words, the scriptures. What can I tell you? All right, this is going to be fire part seven. I think I'm going to end this here. And then we're going to continue in Isaiah chapter nine. Isaiah is a magnificent book. I don't even feel qualified to teach it. I really don't. But there's not much else out there for Bible teachers that, you know, so I guess you're stuck with me. So all blessings, praise, glory, and honor to the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. In Jesus' precious name, amen.